<laughs> well, we're getting close uh, to the finale of the conference. And I, I do feel like we've um, saved some of the best for the last. Uh, my good friend, the Honorable Mary Monsef is here with us today. Um, probably she doesn't need much of an introduction. She's a familiar face to so many of you. But for those of you who don't know her, Miriam was just 30 years old when she was elected to represent Peterborough Kawartha, uh, the place that I also call home. Uh, in 2015, she served uh, with distinction for six years. She was swooped up fairly quickly uh, into cabinet and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, had her responsible for several files, including uh, responsible for establishing the Department of Women and Gender Equality in its full and current form. It was under her leadership after colleagues in this room said thrive so many times that she told us we couldn't say it anymore, uh, that Canada was recognized as a world leader in sexual and reproductive health and rights. She remains a steadfast feminist uh, activist and one of the top 20 global influencers on gender equality alongside some other folks you might know like Michelle Obama and Malala. So Miriam, welcome. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be here today. Thank you, Julia. It's good to be in a real room with people, badass feminists, feeling good about three day conference. Yeah, two, two days, two days, yep. But it's uh, been a long time building actually since uh, you were in parliament, we talked about, you and I talked about what this was going to be and a moment for this group of people to come together to build some connection to build that connective tissue between what we're doing here in Canada, what we're doing around the world, um, and just what we can do if we actually work together. So my first question, I'm starting with a softball. How oh. are you? I am well, thank you. I uh, am grateful to be here with you, Julia, and grateful to your team for including me. Um, I am well, hello everybody. Bonjour, Anin, salam alaikum. Um, thank you so much for your great work. I got to rest, I got to recover and reignite the fire in the belly to continue doing this work. Uh, I did a eat, pray, love thing uh, right after the election. I highly recommend it. Uh, <laughs> how many of you are taking a break this summer? Raise your hands if you're able to. Take a look around, take a look around. There's like I, I 10 of you are taking a break. Please take a break, rest. It made a world of difference for me. Um, and actually, Julia, what has helped me be well today, after the election, uh, it took a while for me to find my bearing again. It's like being on the 401 on the left shoulder going full speed ahead for seven years and you got your team and they're helping you stay awake and stay focused. And then suddenly the break and there's a bit of a whiplash, right? Mm. So I took a break which was the biggest gift I could have given myself. I spent three weeks not talking to anybody, which was glorious. And then I missed people. So I picked up the phone and I called about a hundred badass women across the country, lovely humans. And I just said, okay, I'm ready to smash the patriarchy. Let's go, what are we doing? <laughs> and with the exception of a few, these women were burnt out, stressed out, hanging by a thread, their kids online school, either not going well or it's just stopped. They're saying no to promotions. They're going on sabbatical. They're retiring early. And that fire in the belly that you need to do this work wasn't there anymore. And out of that for me has come a purpose, a new purpose to continue to be part of this movement, to contribute to the movement and support women, gender diverse folks advocating for equity in Canada and around the world through personal development, through professional development. And I draw a lot of energy from that. So being here in this room with you helps with that wellness. Seeing familiar faces of incredible humans who are doing incredible work every day under difficult conditions help me, helps me with my wellness. So tell me, I want to dig a bit. What did rest look like? Did it look like you said not taking phone calls at first? Was it sleeping or was it 
ex like what did it look like for you um because a lot yeah. of people i think i've heard take a break take a break um and and the contours of that are really hard for me to wrap my head around because it feels like the the work is big so what did that look like for you tell us a bit more the break first was to make sure my wonderful team yes. uh, and some of them are here that they landed well they're talented individuals who got shit done and making sure that they were in a good place helped me have peace of mind and then i did sleep uh, it took six weeks for my nervous system to yeah. feel right again uh, i spent and i went away so remember that eat pray love thing i went yeah. away yes. with travel restrictions allowing on triple vax ps um <laughs> and i slept i ate i wrote i spent a lot of time on the yoga mat on the prayer mat and you know i i got a therapist i got a coach and then i started talking to people again i spent more time with relationships which in the work we're doing equity seekers those relationships often are put on hold because well there's just so much happening and there's crises everywhere and we have to tend to it because if we don't who will so rest was tending to those relationships which had paid the price for any success that we've been able to achieve on the equity file on the broadband file thank you thank you for sharing that because i think I, well, you and I have talked about this. I, I agree with your assessment that burnout, um, you know, we work in the frontline healthcare space uh, a lot, supporting frontline healthcare workers around the world, most of whom identify as women. Uh, this is hard work. And I don't, I find that, that uh, it's a bit of a, a tough thing to chase down what that rest can look like for us. I mean, it's obviously also, as you alluded to, it's a privilege to be able to take the time, but I think it's necessary for the movement and so, schedule it. May I just say, it. like, Please, I actually yeah. started putting in my calendar sleep, read. I had dance parties by myself, which I highly recommend. <laughs> I had to plug those in because otherwise it was easy to, to you know, meander away from the healing path. So I just, I was picturing your chief of staff, former chief of staff, Chris Evelyn seen dance party in your calendar. That's why I laughed because I just, I, that's great. He'd be proud. He would be proud. I think, I think so. So, you know, you're a founder, like I alluded to you of a lot of this work of the department of women and gender equality as it is now. So it existed before, but it, I don't know, quadrupled almost in its size and mandate. Um, you really saw the potential in the organizations uh, that are, that are sitting here today, certainly in CanWatch. I remember you really hammering home that we needed every single region of Canada, rural, urban, remote, um, you know, to be in the space to be with us. So here it is. Uh, you've given us some of your thoughts, but really, as you've reflected um, and as you see this vision come to life, what can you tell us? What what advice can you give us? We've got one piece of advice, rest, um, but tell us more. I, I come to this floor today, Julia, with a lot of humility. Anything good that I've been able to achieve in my time as minister has been because of you and folks like you who refused to take no for an answer, who made the case for the capacity building fund, who made the case for feminist recovery, who made the case for Canada becoming number one in the world in investing in SRHR, number one in the world in investing in grassroots women's organizations at home and abroad, number one in LGBT org support. It's, I come here with a lot of humility. Um, yes, rest, and that actually is a really big deal. Uh, we don't talk about what is happening, what has just happened. The pandemic has taken a toll. And you folks, and when I say women, I use the term woman broadly to include all folks, including gender diverse folks. But I remember in those early days, and Reem is here, uh, a few other members of the team, you know, we kind of, after that Friday the 13th in March, we all said, okay, well now what, what do we do? We were planning this big thing at the UN Commission on the Status of Women and then it just paused. We picked up the phone and we called you and you answered our calls across the country and consistently you all said the same thing and you were freaking out and rightfully so that the rates of violence were gonna go up 
isolation was going to increase all sorts of vulnerabilities. And we had to make sure that the last door that women and children knock on when they're experiencing violence and abuse, that shelter, that sexual assault center, that community organization was open and that it was a safe place for them to go and that the staff were paid and that they had the clean supplies and the masks and the PPEs. And ever since those phone calls, you have not stopped. And you've been front lines enduring, helping, witnessing, advocating for some of the most vulnerable in our communities who became even more vulnerable because of COVID. And that stuff, how do you not take that pain home with you in the best of times? But when your home is also your workplace, how do you separate? And what happens when the creme de la creme of the feminist movement is burnt out, stressed out, hanging by a thread, saying no to promotions, not at the table at a time when our voices matter more than ever, well, the patriarchy wins. Mm -hmm. The oppressors win. Part of their strategy isn't just to co-op our language and our strategies that have been used to get things done for decades upon decades, but it's also to drain us. So when you feel guilty about resting, for taking that break, for saying no to that thing that would be really nice to do, but is not a must do, just remember that it's also an act of service. It's an act of persisting. You're preserving yourself because, you know, I'm usually an optimist, Julia, but hard times are coming. Roe v. Wade, look at the women all over the world, including in Afghanistan. They need Canadian women particularly to be strong, to be at their best, to have their, you know, well full, to have the fire in the belly that can engage others in the work, to be at their most creative. And if you're too tired, if your relationships are falling apart because you haven't tended to them, well, we all lose. So when I say rest, especially this summer, it's as radical as I can get right now. And then I would say, keep coming together like this safely, of course, because we are thirsty for those connections. Surround yourself with other badass women who can lift you up. And for the love of God, be nice to one another, be kind to one another. We progressive, as President Obama once said, we tend to eat our own. So be kind with one another. There's a, bot, there's a lot of work waiting for us. Take that break, keep coming together, be kind to one another and just remember, we are part of a movement that has existed long before any of us got here. And we're part of a movement that will continue long after we're gone. And it's up to us in this particular moment in time to strengthen one another so that this movement is strong and thriving and able to meet the challenges to come. Thank you. And thank you for, yes. Our, our team has certainly found in working with within feminist spaces in Canada that um, that point about kindness and not uh, eating our own, as you said, uh, it really is an important one, right? I think that there's a lot of um, disconnection sometimes in the feminist movement. There's a, I mean, all of you represent such fundamentally important spaces and we start to get into what's I, I think of as a scarcity mentality where we're pitting good against good. People ask us about this mm -hmm. all the time when it comes to the international development file. Well, what about here at home? And it's like, since when do we have a limit on the good that we need to be doing in the world? Since when is there some sort of uh, cap on our humanity that dictates that we need to, we only have this much good in us? Obviously there's a fiscal context, but that fiscal context is completely under our control. And I find that that scarcity mentality really creates, um, you know, this this um, competition, 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 and uh, you know, sort of a sense of who's the most feminist and who deserves what issue is the most deserved um, of you know of support and things like that. So I really appreciate that. How did you manage that? I mean, you both had that kind of as a political downward pressure as you were on this stage constantly, as well as you did have to make choices when it came to the types of resource that were being allocated. 
what was your mentality around that? Um, was it, I'm just going to keep going for more? Or what was your mentality around that? Well, I got my courage from you. <laughs> and I got to visit so many of you. And I know folks are watching online across the country, the Angela McDougals with Feminist Deliver. And, you know, across the country, you made the case that without capacity to do the work, you were spending your time hunched over your laptops, applying for grants that you may or may not get instead of working on the work itself, which was helping women, children, and gender diverse folks thrive. You made that case and you gave me that courage. And every time I was in a room making the case, I took you with me. And I was fortunate too, like the prime minister of Canada for the first time ever goes out and wears his feminism proudly on his sleeves. And he gave me a big long runway and he made time for me and he listened to me as did my colleagues. So, you know, at cabinet treat, retreat X, when I'd stand up and say, my number one priority is supporting the sustainability of the women's movement. I had a platform to make that case and say, this is creme de la creme. This is mostly women and youth and, you know, racialized folks and folks with disabilities and exceptionalities working in this movement. So we're creating jobs. It's making a world of difference in communities around health and safety, as well as economic development. And, you know, this investment and, and, you know, we've had many folks make the case, the best investment you can make is in grassroots women's organizations. If gender equality is your uh, mandate, it's the best investment you can make. You get more money out of every single dollar that you invest in them and you stretch these funds to their max and you find creative partnerships to further leverage these funds. So it was an easy case to make once I understood it. And I understood it because you showed the way. And the more results you achieve, the easier it gets for the person advocating for you in that place. So yes, rest so that you can keep rocking it, so that you can build the capacity to continue to add new voices to the movement, build your succession plans, build your strategic plans, build partnerships at home as well as abroad. And you know, your success makes the case for further investments. And frankly, make sure that there's a political price to pay if someone ever dares to question the value of your work. Remember COVID has taught us a lot, including the fact that your work is essential work. Your work is essential to our survival. So please remember that and keep up the great work because it is indeed essential. So this is a great segue. We talked about your former boss, the prime minister, feminist prime minister. What we've seen uh, across the world is this increased partisanship and <laughs> something that's really important to, uh, to us at Equal Futures Network, but also to me personally is the idea that we have to find the feminists everywhere. We have to find those advocating for gender equality because this movement does not benefit from wedging, from wedging issues, from um, you know, any per, per, particular party claiming ownership over the agenda. Um, and we've, we've seen this in the US in really devastating and, and dramatic ways um, that I think we're gonna see the largest backslides um, you know, that we have in decades for critical rights of, of women and gender diverse people. So how do we find each other in this moment of polarization? How do we find um, ways to, to engage those across party lines um, to ultimately build a movement that's resilient um, and build a movement that everyone can see themselves in? I was also just at home in Alberta with my family. And so really like, um, it just, this is just, so evident to me that sometimes the ways we speak in Peterborough or in Ontario or whatever are very different than the ways people speak in other parts of this country. And I've been thinking like, how do I reach into that world and find a bridge with my family? <laughs> so any advice? I mean, I have a psych degree, but I don't think yeah, I can provide right. that kind of advice. Um, okay, I'll go back to my first point. This is hard work and it's years and years and years and years of hard work ahead and hard times ahead. A lot of success to build on, but it's deeply personal to every single one of you. Otherwise, you'd be working in the private sector and making a lot of money and like, you know, 
doing what you got to do, but you've chosen this path of giving of yourself for the betterment of others. First things first, oxygen mask. Please take care of yourselves. Collaboration, reaching across the aisle, meaningful dialogue, listening skills, and you know, finding common ground. That's all really, really important. But it's also very, very energy intensive. It takes a lot of work. It takes strategy. It takes communication. Collaboration is hard. I don't know how you manage your calendars. I'm you know, learning how to manage my calendar without <laughs> my brilliant team. But, you know, that stuff takes a toll. So take care of you first, first and foremost. And then second, be kind to one another. You are in this together. We are in this together. And we haven't seen each other in a very long time. So rebuilding those connections, you know, whether it's a phone call or a walk and talk or whatever it is, make time for it. I recently heard uh, National Association of Women in the Law, Tiffany Butler was telling me that uh, it, with their Feminist Law Reform course, Feminist Law Reform 101, which they developed, and it's available for folks to use, uh, that a book club has come around it in the Yukon, for example. And so women are finding, and these are executive directors and you know badass professionals who are finding ways to come together so that your fire in the belly can fuel others and that camaraderie, just, we can just be reminded of it. And then the third thing I would say around that is, you know, in my Eat, Pray, Love chapter, I spent with folks who were struggling and then I spent time, spent time folks with who were struggling and I spent time with folks who like, have it really good, very privileged folks. And you know what I learned? No matter how good you have it, no one's okay. No one's okay. You know, what a cruel disease. At a time when we need each other the most, the thing that we have to do to keep our loved ones safe is to keep apart. We've had to stay home. We've missed weddings and birthdays and graduations and funerals and all the good things in life were suddenly taken away. And, you know, that is if you haven't experienced a major loss. No one's okay. And what are feminists really good at, right? We're fierce, we're persistent, we're creative, we find a way, there's always a way, and we're very clear on our vision but we're also compassionate. We're also caring. We also put people first. So if you're looking to strengthen a movement that is meant to support people and get them to be at their best, to get their communities to be at their best, we'll come at it from a place of compassion because people are hurting, people have lost, people are grieving, and we have not had time or place, or dare I say permission to grieve so feminists, you know how to do this stuff really well. You know how the icebreakers and the personal and the professional development and the bridge building and the collaborating, the kindness that you show one another and to your communities, put that on display. And young women, you are the face of this movement. You are the future of this movement. Take care of yourselves because the other side is also learning from our best practices and it's young women as the face of their movement and with strength with creativity with using facts with being the most reasonable you by having some fun in the process you'll grow this movement you'll overcome the hard parts and build partnerships with the private sector because government's done a lot of work and we're at a point where okay private sector it's up to you those seats around corporate boards that need to be filled with diverse experiences and perspectives, that ball is in your court now. And, you know, they're going to be catching up. And there's a lot of great work being done. I'm learning a lot about that right now. But they're going to be counting on your expertise. And so open those doors for collaboration with folks that we've not worked with before, particularly in the private sector, because they're looking for the solutions that are almost second nature to you welcome those inquiries. Don't look down upon them because they used the wrong word or they didn't say intersectionality in their presentation. Find ways to find common ground with them and build those relationships the way those who've come before us have built creative, interesting, but enduring relationships. I love that. I think that's fantastic. 
Fantastic advice. I'm, what are you, what are you up to? What are you doing next? What's coming, what's coming now? I mean, we talked a little bit about Afghanistan, but yeah. I, tell me more about where, so I do get asked all, because I'm in Peterborough, all the time for your phone number and I don't give it out Who? and I won't I know nah. I know I know your partner's also <laughs> sitting here I, I from feminists looking for uh, you to support various causes so I know you're in high demand but what what are you up to what what's next for you well I was in Ottawa for the last few days first and foremost I'm working with the Canadian Association of Former Parliamentarians democracy is look the status of women and democracy as i saw it in afghanistan was a canary in the mind for the status of women and democracy all over the world so in canada with the convoy particularly in january that was a big wake-up call for me so the former parliamentarians are working to strengthen the work they're doing in communities across the country uh, particularly engagement with young people around civic engagement civic literacy civic action so i'm helping with that and i'm so proud to be part of that work they're also working to support Afghan women parliamentarians who are already here in Canada. These badass women who like did all sorts of great things in Afghanistan are here now. They're in Saskatoon, they're in Vancouver, they're in Toronto, they're in, they're in Calgary, and they're looking for opportunities to give back. So the Canadian Association of Former Parliamentarians is working to create opportunities for collaboration for them. They've asked for fellowships and opportunities to work with post-secondary institutions. So if you're interested in supporting that work, please reach out to the Canadian Association of Former Parliamentarians, because when those women have an anchor and a safe harbor, both those things at the same time, at a post-secondary institution in Canada, they can rock their women peace and security work and elevate the voices of their sisters who are not lucky enough to get here. So still working on the Afghan file because, well, we have to. Uh, and I'm setting up a business based on my North Star, which is supporting women and children and helping them thrive. And this idea of supporting badass women with personal and professional development uh, opportunities, it's become an anchor for me, for sure. Uh, and of course, I'm working with Trent University, uh, my alma mater. So uh, I get to channel my inner Oprah soon. Uh, and I will tell you more about that as the information becomes available. Uh, and for folks who want to get in touch with me, I'm working with a brilliant team in Peterborough. Uh, and we're setting up uh, setting up a bit of a system. And so I'll be launching a website and you can get a hold of me that way. But in the meantime, send me good vibes. Uh, and I'll be sending you good vibes too. Know that I'm incredibly grateful for the work that you're doing because I know I got to take a time out and do my little eat, pray, love thing and heal and recover and reignite and relaunch because you were still working. Because I had peace of mind that you were the ma making the most of every single dollar that was invested in your organizations. That the women and children who were haunting me during the pandemic, not knowing if they were gonna be safe, that they were in good hands with you. So keep up the great work, knowing that I'm eternally grateful for the opportunities you created for me. And I look forward to rocking it with you in the future, but not before you take some rest. So those of you who are taking a break, let me see those hands again. Okay, take a look around the room, folks. Those of you who are taking a break, please go out of your way in the next little bit to speak in detail about what you're doing. Remember when it was cool to be really, really busy? When it was cool to go to work when you were really, really sick? That's not cool anymore. <laughs> Start making it cool for feminists to take a break and do it by talking in at length about how you're gonna take that break and who you're gonna spend time with because God knows you've earned it. Well, I, I think that's a beautiful way to wrap this conversation. Uh, with five minutes to go. With five minutes to go. And I just thank you for being here. I, 
so much of this was because you believed in the people in this room and we're just so grateful to you for showing up. I know this was one of your first big uh, appearances. Feels like the right place to do it. Thank you for picking up the phone when I called, <laughs> when I called, because I was like, I don't think she wants to talk to people right now. Um, but I really appreciate that you picked up the phone, that you're here. Uh, we will be running one of these again uh, okay. next year. We're going to be looking for lots of private sector investment. So maybe the business that you, you know, like we'll see, we'll see what happens. She's um, always working. <laughs> it this is why so you take the call. <laughs> so successful that you can uh, sponsor some of these great people to come to the conference, but we will, we'll follow you. We'll watch where you're going uh, with keen interest. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being you. Thank you for taking a rest so that you could come back to the stage and we'll, we'll see you soon. This is not goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I think on next, I'll give you a hug. Again. Are we so hugging? Are we allowed to masks. hug? Yeah, we're wearing masks. Okay. okay, we're triple vaccinated. Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. Thank I'm you. Go that way. Yes, go that way. All right. So we are at yes. Clap again for Miriam, please. Thank you. I can see people in the audience going like this. Yes, I invite the clapping. Am I good for the excellent? So this is bringing us to the almost close. I am going to do my thank yous. I know thank yous are a little bit, uh, um, you know, they take a time when everyone's ready to get to the road, uh, but I'm going to come up one more time after our final speaker to do uh, thank yous and to thank you for being here. So please stick around. But first, uh, let me introduce our final speaker, Jenna Suds, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Women and Gender Equality. Um, Minister Ian started off our conference uh, yesterday. Man, I, I was gonna say a couple of days ago, but yesterday. Um, so it's when she referred to her parliament, Parliamentary Secretary, Jenna Suds. Um, so it's very fitting that she will deliver closing remarks for us. She was elected um, as the MP for Canada Carleton in 2021. She's worked as an economist, a municipal counselor, and a community advocate. She's an active member of her community, volunteering with the Canada Food Cupboard and Ottawa Network for Education. We heard a little bit about her work, I believe, on menstrual hygiene and other things. Please join me in welcoming uh, Jenna Sutton. To the podium. <laughs> Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. Such a pleasure to be able to join you this afternoon and, and a big thank you to CanWatch. I know this has been uh, an incredibly successful two days uh, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to join you this afternoon for the close of Equal Futures' uh, first ever Gender Equality Summit. So as mentioned, my name is Jenna Suds, and I have the great honor of being the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Women, Gender Equality and Youth. And I know after two days, uh, I'm sure that you've absorbed, you've learned a lot as you've listened, uh, and I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here, uh, obviously in the country's capital and coincidentally my hometown. Uh, a city I am proud to call home and actually here at my uh, alma mater as well, which is fun. So I know that we heard from amazing uh, women yesterday, uh, such as Farzana Doctor, an author and activist of four critically acclaimed novels about feminism, and Joanna Griffins, founder and CEO of, of Nix, which you all probably know has a mission uh, to empower women to be unapologetically free. We also heard from Shanez Anand Steele this morning and her work about decolonizing our minds and building solidarity with Indigenous communities. And of course, my dear colleague, Minister Marcy Ian, who I know opened the summit and discussed the many important initiatives and policies that our government is taking to bridge gaps and create a more equal Canada. Listening to these amazing women over the course of this summer is, uh, uh, this summit, excuse me, is undoubtedly empowering for all of us. I know in my own experience, I wouldn't be here today without 
the encouragement and the support that I've received from a number of incredible female leaders uh, in my life. I've been quite fortunate to have a very diverse, uh, somewhat rocky career and uh, you know, had the opportunity in all of the decisions that I made as I made pivots and took on big challenges to have some really incredible women there in my corner and helping me as I made those decisions and took leadership roles. So mentorship, I know, has changed my life. Uh, I'm sure in your lives, you recognize the value and how impactful it is, especially when it comes from other women. I also know firsthand that working together is vital. As I know my colleague, uh, Minister Marcy Ian had said in her opening remarks yesterday, to accomplish anything, we need you. The organizations from coast to coast to coast, the experts, the advocates and communities moving women and gender equality forward. Many of whom I know are here with us today. As parliamentary secretary, Minister Ian has entrusted me to lead certain files, such as the menstrual equity pilot program. To help inform and shape this initiative, I've been meeting with stakeholders to hear what's happening on the ground, to understand what are the needs. And it's only through full understanding of an issue that together we can create meaningful change. This grassroots approach for the first ever Federal Menstrual Equity Fund is just one of the many examples of how your work and your knowledge helps inform important decisions, initiatives, and projects. So whether you're a grassroots organization or an organization operating on a national or even international scale, continue to speak up collaborate and share your expertise because we need you. Our initiatives and policies are heavily shaped by the work that you do and your advocacy. So thank you, thank you for a great summit and I look forward to continued dialogue and opportunities to collaborate. Thank you. All right, excellent way to end it. That's a wrap for the conference. So I'm gonna say my thank yous as I indicated to you. When you hear the word Jex, okay, Jex, J-E-X, which is the last name of the last person and probably the most important person to thank, you can clap, but you don't have to clap for everyone because then it turns into, I have to wait for you to clap and it's a whole thing. So that's how we're gonna run this show. So we have summit partners who've been amazing to work with. Women and Gender Equality Canada, you just heard from Jenna, has been a fantastic partner to both envision this thing, fund this thing, and be really partners throughout. The What Works 2022 um, brought to you by Social Project, uh, Progress Index has been an excellent co-partner in developing this. Future of Good and the Women's Economic Resilience Summit, which is happening right now. Again, if you want some more content, if you want some really inspiring talks, you want to continue this, head over there. You get free um, access. Talk to me about that afterwards. Uh, Lizbeth, our media partner, who's going to share the stories out and has been sharing the stories of what's happening here. CPAC, thank you so much for recording this and getting this message out uh, to as many Canadians as possible. Um, these run these events don't run themselves and that is for sure we uh, have worked with an amazing company that's both purpose driven and just really good at their jobs connect seven i'd like to specifically point out pascal i said you couldn't clap so i'm just you just got to stick to that even though i really want to make everyone clap because pascal is amazing um and as is connect seven so thank you to the whole team they've been organizing everything that you have uh, been a part of here the American Translation Company, making French and English available to all of you with really complex concepts. Encore Audiovisual, if I could pull back this curtain, you'd see a whole bunch of folks behind there who've made this accessible uh, to you so you can hear it, but also to our, they're laughing, uh, also to our partners and our folks who are sitting uh, around the country listening to this. 
Pinpoint National Photography right here, uh, taking photos of us. So again, we can share our youth bursary recipients. There's 25, 23, 24 of you. Um, you've made this. I noticed you networking. I saw you engaging people. Thank you for being here. Uh, board of Directors, my CanWatch Board of Directors, best Board of Directors in the world, um, and the Equal Futures Network Advisory Committee. Mem mem many of the members are here today. So then there's the CanWatch team who made this look easy when it was not. We rescheduled this thing. We omicron this thing. We It was a lot of logistics and a lot of faith to believe that there would be a moment when we'd be able to physically be together like this in a space like this. So thank you, team, for believing in this. And finally, uh, the vision behind this, the person who pulled together this amazing content in less than eight weeks once we really got the go-ahead is my good colleague, uh, Aaron Jex, who's right over there. Go! Aaron, you are brilliant, and I'm just so, it's such a privilege to work with you, and I hope that you feel and see the results of uh, the thoughtfulness that you put into this, and we'll see it come. Thank you for being here, uh, most importantly. Thanks for believing in what this thing is. Thanks for seeing that we, we did our best to make this stage accessible, representative, but we still had so many people missing, so many people that needed to be here. We're already thinking about that for our very exciting uh, Equal Futures Network Summit that will take place in May of 2023 in Whitehorse. So yeah, I know, big reveal. I didn't know if I was allowed to say it and then Charmaine is like, it's in your speaking notes. And I was like, okay, yeah, I know it's it's in there. Okay. so. Whitehorse is a, a further place for many of you to get to, for many of us in Canada uh, to get to. We are going to think about that. We're trying to build it in uh, to how we make it accessible both online, but start thinking about it and start thinking about how, what you want that stage to look like. If you want to get more involved in the planning and more engaged with the Equal Futures Network, please reach out to Aaron and I, and we'll talk to you about the steering committee. We'll talk to you about different opportunities that they are. We want to build on every lesson learned from this conference and make that one amazing. So I look forward to seeing all of you, plus another, you know, 100 or 150 people up in Whitehorse. It's a beautiful place, and it'll be a beautiful moment for us to come together once again. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks again for being with us.